Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. More voices today. Uh, if you watched last week, when I said good morning, church, you heard several voices saying, good morning, good morning, how are you? And it was all Larry. Because Bob and Peg were not with us last week, having uh, picked up their friend from the airport. What time did you guys get back in last? Plus? 1 a.m. 1 a.m. And, you know, they were still asleep at 5 o'clock the next day, so they couldn't be here. You know, something about aging. I don't know what it is, but... Uh, <laughs> Good to have you guys with us here today. Get there. <laughs> I'm getting there. Believe me, I'm getting there. So uh, I actually talked to a homeless person today to ask me if I would give her a ride. And I said, no. She goes, why? I said, because I'm going to go pick up my wife. And she goes, oh, I bet she's a young woman. <laughs> what, do I look like a gigolo? I mean, what? what? No, I said, she, she's as old as I am. You know, and uh, anyway, kind of interrupt. No, she's not. She's your age. Okay, which is younger than me. In fact, I, I, I saw Dwayne at Costco. We were getting stuff for Friday night's Friday Night Light. And I was telling Dwayne about this. And he goes, well, you could have said, yes, she is younger. She's younger than me. You know, which <laughs> in that case would have been true. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, happy June the 26th. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, if you're watching this before 11 o'clock a.m. and you're here in Chico, please note that today's the day of our after worship breakfast. Put on your breakfast? mask. Barbecue. Barbecue. Thank you. That's just a test. I want to see if you know you guys are listening. You're making pancakes. Yeah. <laughs> Sausage and your batter man. Uh, anyway, it's our, our our annual after worship barbecue today. At 11 o'clock, you're welcome to come. Hamburgers, hot dogs, we're asking people to bring goodies. Again, if you're watching at home and it's not quite that time yet, grab your mask and go out the door. Come over and have fun with us. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, thank you, Clark, for the music today. Clark's on vacation this week, and so uh, I haven't viewed his link that he sent us to post up on this. Uh, but uh, one of the things about recording music and recording sermons for the last two years is... Uh, Clark goes on vacation. I, I said, Clark, just put together a bunch of videos, man. Let's, let's have some music. So thank you, Clark. I hope you're enjoying yourself out there somewhere. I know he's probably with a windsurfer somewhere on some lake uh, swinging around somewhere. Clark, I hope you're having a good time on your vacation. All right. Praise be to God. Let's pray together, shall we? God, we give you thanks for your grace and your blessing. We do thank you for Friday night with our Friday night light, uh, the fun we had and, and the missional offering that we took for my my friend Big Crick, Big Chris Fredrickson on the loss of his shop. Uh, Lord, I hope that the gift that Aldersgate gives will be a blessing to he and to Lisa at this time in their decision making about do they rebuild or do they move to a whole nother community. Uh, Lord, guide them in that. Be with the uh, people we know that have been fighting COVID with, with, with Veronica, who has been down for a, a week. Glad that she's been feeling better as of last Sunday, but yet still testing positive. And for those others that I've known that, that have had it, we thank you for, for negative results. And even though Terry Rayleigh was not able to work in the vacation Bible school at a church because of the positive test, we thank you that other people, including her daughter Beth, stepped in and uh, worked there with the children in, in Marysville. Lord, we thank you for that. Guide us now as we read from your word and we continue our look at the virtues. Lord, we thank you for this. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we're continuing on with the seven godly virtues, the seven, that is what I call them. Is that what I changed it to? What were they before? Some other virtues. Some other virtues. Anyway, seven living virtues. Seven living virtues. That's what it was. That's, that's what it was. And uh, continuing on again in 2 Peter chapter 5, by now you probably haven't memorized. We're going on to the next one. For this very reason, 2 Peter chapter 1 at verse 5. Where is my mind today? It's all confused. Howling mad, confused, for those of you who've seen Henry V. Anyway, back to it. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance and this is our oh, godliness. I'm sorry, that was last week's. And to godliness, what well, we're looking at this week, brotherly kindness. God grant us understanding on this reading of your holy word today. So now we're on the next virtue. And in the New International Translation, it says brotherly kindness. 
Uh, and of course, as I, I've done with all these others, I looked it up in the Greek to see what exactly is there. I got to tell you what is there for, for what, how it's translated here in the NIV, brotherly kindness, surprised me because, and you'll probably get this, the word is Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. That's often how it is translated. I even have a translation in my office which says brotherly love. Why then does the NIV say brotherly kindness? Why do some translations say brotherly affection? When the word is philia adelphi, philia, love, adelphoi, the brothers, the love for the brothers. As you, you, those of you who are living out in Pennsylvania land, you know that Pennsylvania is known as the city of bro brotherly love. Tell that to the athletes that play in Philadelphia and their team doesn't win. What do you hear? Boo. Absolutely right. The city of brotherly love is known for the boo birds in a big way. But that is indeed what Philadelphia means. There is a, 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 a village, a town, an area in Turkey today that is also known as Philadelphia. The same word, Phileo Adelphi, Philadelphia, the love of the brothers, or sometimes known as brotherly love. Well, then why does this translation say brotherly kindness? Why do other translations say brotherly affection? Well, because we keep on reading from where I stopped. Look at verse 7. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, what's the next word? Love. Now, not surprisingly, the word there is agape, which we call uh, uh, unmerited favor, uh, 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 God's grace, unmerited grace, uh, love without any limits at all, the kind of love that God loves us with. Well, because of that, it's translated brotherly kindness, brotherly affection. Otherwise, you'll have and brotherly love and two brotherly love, love, and it begins to sound rather redundant. So even the translators of the Greek change it to where we don't have two seemingly sounding uh, virtues back to back, even though in the Greek, one is brotherly love or the love of the brothers, and the other is simply agape, unmerited favor, God's unrelenting love that we will never deserve or earn. So what do we gain from this? Brotherly kindness. Well, it's interesting. In history, this word, phile adelphoi, was used by the Greeks as something that they wanted to, it was a virtue that they wanted to practice. The love of your brothers, the kindness to your brothers and your sisters. The affection you have for your brothers and sisters. But in the Greek culture, as held by the Greeks, this love, this kindness, this affection is shared only with your family members. Your brothers, your sisters, your mother, your father, your own children. Outside of the family, the Greeks care less whether you loved anybody or not. It's almost like, you know, I love my brother, I love my sister, but since you're not part of my family, you can kiss my rear end. Really, that's the way the Greeks were. They, they, they supported each other, but that is as far as it went. But then along comes this new religion, which at first was known as the way. And then it would take on the name Christian, Christianity. In fact, in the book of Acts, it's told the first, this is the first time the word Christian was used. It tells us what town that was in. This became the word, to be Christ-like. To live in relationship of a loving God and to represent your relationship with that loving God. It's happening in the Christian church because of this new religion, this new relationship, is that this virtue Brotherly love, brotherly kindness, brotherly affection, which the Greeks kept only for themselves. The Christian church begins to apply it to everyone within the church. 
You don't just love your own physical brother and sister, but you love those who you share a foundation in the Messiah Jesus. And so it begins to go into the community. You would see people treating each other with kindness, with affection, who are not related. And it began to change society in ways that had never been seen before. Is that you are going to have an affection and kindness for this brother or this sister you are not related to, but yet you share the blood of Christ with them. Therefore, they are your family and you treat them as such. The world had never seen anything like that. It's interesting to me, but it even began to affect society that didn't claim to be followers of Jesus. I have a book at home called 25 Centuries of Human Warfare. It goes back 500 years before Jesus and takes us in to the 21st century, looking at wars and battles in human civilization. 200 or 2,500 years. And one thing this book pointed out, you look at battles happening prior to the first century in Christianity, and what do you see? Huge brutality. No mercy. If you lost, it's better to have been killed than to survive that battle. Because what happened to you afterwards was dreadful stuff. If you're lucky, you turned into a slave. But warfare and what went on and it began to change at the end of the first century. Why? Why? Because what does Jesus teach? Love one another. Love your enemy. Love your neighbor as yourself. These teachings, even to people who didn't follow Jesus, all of a sudden you begin to see, especially in the area of warfare, you end up seeing people treating others with compassion. The only two places where that seemed to get challenged in world history was when the Spaniards went into South America and ran against the, 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 the remnants of the Mayans and, and, and the Aztecs who didn't hear these messages about love one another, love your enemy. And some of the violence that was done in those conflicts was hideous. But Europe hadn't seen it in years. Second time happened in the 20th century. You guys know where? Where was this idea of give mercy to your enemy challenged in a big, huge way in the 20th century? The people who fought against the Japanese in World War II because the Japanese still follow the, the code of Bushido, which has nothing to do with love your enemy. In fact, Bushido code was, uh, if your enemy surrenders, you have the right to kill him because after all, he just gave up his humanity by surrendering to you. It, it, in both cases, this teaching that we see as changing the world got challenged and the people who fought against these enemies had some real struggles socially, psychologically, and every other way. When, when, when this became a part of the Christian church, that you will share as a virtue, brotherly kindness, brotherly affection with people outside your family, it began to change lives. And the church began to have more and more effect on the world in which they lived. You mean to tell me that you love me even when I want to kill you? The answer was yes. This began, in fact, these last two, these last two virtues seem to react around Christianity solely more than any of the others. Affection for your brother and your sister who you do not know and love for everyone. We'll talk about that next week. That's what this virtue is. It's kind of like that little ditty we shared a couple of years ago, WWJD. What would Jesus 
do. It's a way of challenging your own ethic as you're walking in the world in which we live and you come across a situation where somebody might want to treat you harshly or, or, or not treat you the way you want to do and, and our immediate reaction is to, to get angry and to yell back at them. What would Jesus do? It's an ethic that changed the church. It's an ethic that helped to change the world. Even though, as I said, many places in the world are not going to acknowledge that their own desire for kindness comes from the teaching of Jesus and therefore the church. It brings up two questions for me. One, how are we doing in the church? How are we doing in the church? Do we share affection and kindness for each other as we come together for worship? Do Sometimes. we share? What's that? Sometimes. Sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. I wouldn't really. It's one of those redundant questions. That's okay. I'll, I'll take the answer. If we see somebody, and look at this happens, folks. And I'll, I'll say it again next week. We are called to love each other. What we are not called to do is to like each other. There are people we're going to come in contact with that we do not like. Do I hear an amen? Please don't leave me alone. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Peg didn't say anything. Thank you, Peg. The men said it. See, men are more honest. <laughs> There's people that we're going to come in contact with with and it can be in the church and out of the church that we just don't like but this is not asking us to like each other this is asking us can we treat each other with affection can we treat each other with kindness can we be christ-like so that's 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 my first question how are we doing in the church there are churches that have ceased to exist because of an argument between two people and everybody in the church took one of the other sides. Instead of trying to make kindness and affection and love their modus operandi, they took choices and they took sides. And I find that very sad. Where is God's grace in the church? I shared a story in my Bible study a couple weeks ago about a couple that I knew who uh, I was going to perform their wedding for and a couple weeks before the wedding they both came to me and they said we can't get married and I said why not and so because their pastor her pastor because they were from two different churches her pastor had said if you marry this man you can no longer teach Sunday school in this church you can no longer play organ in this church why well because Jesus said let not the divorced woman get remarried and so she said we can't get married in other words, one part of that is it was more important to her to continue to teach Sunday school and to play the organ than to marry the man she felt God had brought into her life. Because that was something I asked both of them. Do you believe God brought you together? You know, well, well, so do I. Now, what's interesting is Jesus was addressing that, that's in the Sermon on the Mount, to, to, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were just righteously writing letters of divorce. And Jesus goes on to say, unless there is adultery, you are divorcing your wife incorrectly, and then let not the divorced woman get remarried. Now, again, the, the only place in the scripture text where that is actually addressed is in Deuteronomy, where Jesus is talking, uh, sorry, Leviticus, where Jesus is talking to the priestly class and says, if you divorce your wife, so be it, but do not let that woman get remarried. That's the only thing Jesus said. And who is he addressing these things to when he says, you have heard it said? He doesn't say you've read it. He's addressing that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the rabbis who are there listening to him. And he says, I tell you, anybody who marries that divorced woman is wrong. And I said to my friends, I will gladly perform your wedding. And if there's sin in the situation, let it fall on me. But then she brought up, well, what do I do? My pastor won't let me play organ anymore. Well, let me teach Sunday school. I've been doing that for 27 years. I said, well, I got to ask you, where is grace best served 
in this particular situation. She said, what do you mean? I said, if you stand up in church on Sunday morning and say to the people you're worshiping with, uh, look at, pastor won't let me uh, continue to play organ for you or won't let me continue to teach Sunday school if I get married in two weeks. He said, how many of you are in favor of that? So what do you think the people in your church are gonna do? They've known you for 27 years. So they probably all stand up and tell him, no way, you can't do that. I said, that's really neat to know that you have the backing of the people that you worship with, praise be to God. I said, but how, is that really serving the grace of God? To divide the congregation over one issue? Or is there another way that grace can be served? Through kindness, through affection. She says, what do you mean? I said, well, what are your options? Well, my options are to stay there and fight it out or go find another church. I said, ah, which way will serve grace better? Even though you might be very right in that congregation, but is that what that congregation needs? What does it mean to say, I want to treat each other with brotherly affection, brotherly kindness? Because things like this will split a church. How is grace? best serve? That's the first question that comes to me on this. The second question that comes to me on this, brotherly kindness, brotherly affection, and as the word actually says in the Greek, brotherly love, uh, what is the goal of it? I mean, there's, there's a reason why the writer of Second Peter wrote all of this. What is the goal of it? And I think these last two kind of sum up the goal more than anything else. Verse 4 says this, through these, he, God, has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. There's one reason, there's one goal, that by practicing, those who do these things, those who practice it, by practicing godly, I'm, I'm sorry, brotherly affection, brotherly kindness for each other, we are going to work to participate in God's divine nature and to escape the corruption caused by evil desire. Do we want to live together in peace or do we not? Another goal, also in this very passage, verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hope in your daily walk that your life is effective for Jesus? No. Sometimes we never know, right? So, so we simply just never know. We do the works of God not because we want to thank or we want our name in the lights. We do the work of God because God has saved us by his blood. And what is our reaction to that great act of grace? But to say, here I am, Lord, send me. This is one thing we were talking about this last Wednesday in my Bible study. When, when Jesus says, do not practice your piety in front of people to be seen by others. What is my, 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 my purpose in this? If you possess these qualities in increasing nature, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Do we want to have productive lives in the name of Jesus? I hope we do. Well, the one way to hope to have some kind of success in that is to practice brotherly kindness. People, we may never know. We may never know the actions we have on somebody else's life. I had a, a, a friend of mine one time, he, well, we went to seminary together, and in his last year, he decided not to go into ministry. I said, why? He says, because I have no guarantee that anything I ever say in any pulpit anywhere is going to be listened to by anybody. I said, you're right. He said, but we do it anyway in the hopes that at least one person will listen. <laughs> I had the great blessing many years ago for a woman and a and a man whose wedding I performed. Still in Bakersfield. And this woman, her, her, her father and mother were, were in the church that I worked at. She was in the youth group and, and uh, had, had a wonderful time. In fact, her father was the reason I started playing my trombone again. And the man that was her husband, Travis, he and I played together often and a number of times at Christmas time. And my son would eventually join us, among others, and have a lot of fun with that. And I had the great joy of performing their wedding on a very hot day in Bakersfield, and yes, we were outside. Ah, 
Casey, you thought your day was hot. <laughs> Casey's wedding here in Chico a number of years ago. I do believe it was the hottest June day in record here in Chico. That day was miserable. The wedding was fun, but we all wanted to jump in the pool. That was right behind us. But Travis and, and Stephanie's wedding was, it was a glorious thing. About four years later, her father wrote me a note, had a picture of his grandson. And he says, Scott, this is my grandson. Everett Scott Thomas. He says, and don't be confused. You are the Scott he was named after. And he said, Scott, you will never know the impact you had on my daughter's life. Brothers and sisters, we do the work of God and we do it out of brotherly kindness, out of brotherly affection. We may never hear anybody ever say, you know, I got to tell you, I really appreciate you. You may never, ever hear that. It doesn't mean it isn't going on to try to change lives. If you keep these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's goal number two. Goal number three, rather interesting, because it's really a subject matter of 2 Peter. 2 Peter was written for a reason. And that's in verse 11. I'm going to start with verse 10, because verse 11 without verse 10 is out of context. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, if you practice these things, you will never fall. And here it is. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The whole point of 2 Peter is what's called the eschaton, the end times. 2 Peter is all about eschatology. What does the church do until the Lord comes back? In fact, if you read chapter 3 of 2 Peter, if you have one of those Bibles that has a subheading on the top of what each chapter stands for, it will say the day of the Lord. Chapter 3, he's talking about the Lord's coming back, and he's saying, some of you are saying, where is the Lord? Why is he slow? And, 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 and that's the writer says, he's not slow as some count slowness. After all, to God, a day is as a and a thousand years is as a day. He's talking about the eschaton. In the meantime, we must still be the church. I, I say to people who ask, I don't care when the Lord is coming back. My one concern is what is the church doing until then? The whole thing that he's saying here is, if you do these things, if you practice these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Is that your hope? Is that your goal? Then are you practicing brotherly kindness? There's the question. That's the goal. Are we ready to meet the Lord? Are we living a life that is Christ-like? This sixth virtue became synonymous with the church. Do we share brotherly love, brotherly affection, brotherly kindness to people that are not related to us, but we share the blood of the Lamb, therefore we're part of the family? And do we express that to people we come in contact with who when they say, why would you go to the church? Well, I'll tell you what, come and be a part of the family. That's hopefully why we do what we do. Next week, I finish this up by looking at that final word, agape, love. In the meantime, brothers and sisters, treat each other with affection, kindness because God has paid the price for all of us again we're not asked to like each other we are asked to be kind to each other and this is not beyond our ability to do so God we thank you for your grace we thank you for your blessing and again I'm reminded of the words of Paul I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength including practicing brotherly affection brotherly kindness to the people I come in contact with. Grow us as a family. 
and grow us as a people united together. No, we don't all like the same music. No, we don't all like the same foods. Some people even eat broccoli. But yet can I still be kind to such an individual in all seriousness? Lord, let us get beyond the petty differences and realize that we are all called by you to be your church until you come. Use us, guide us, send us, and may we all say, here I am, Lord, send me. Send us forth now in your peace and your grace. And guide us through this day and this week we're about to go through. We thank you and pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. See you next week, people. Have a good day.